This episode is sponsored by Shutterstock.com. With over 20 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 30% off, head on over to Shutterstock.com and use offer code GAMEBREAKER7. This episode is also brought to you by Audible. For a free 30-day trial and to receive a free audiobook, just head on over to audible.com slash gamebreaker. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to episode two of The Game Biz. I'm Gary Gannon, and you're watching Game Breaker TV. And we got a special show for you guys today. First, I got to introduce our main man, Mr. Monty Sharma. Monty, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, Gary. How are things with you? Excellent, excellent, excellent. And joining us this week for a special interview, Mr. Derek Wise from JagX. How are you, sir? Hey, doing good. How are you, Gary? Thanks for joining us today. Hi, no so, problem. We got lots of questions. We get lots and lots and lots of questions. How do I break in the industry? How do I do this? What if I have a game idea? Um, let's start, let's start off first with just tell tell us a little bit about your career, school, like where you, you know what's what's your background. Um, I've got kind of one of those really weird backgrounds when it comes to uh, the industry that I'm in today. Um, started out uh, wanting to be a tennis player, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> uh, figured out I wasn't good enough to, to make that happen, so I joined the U.S. Marines, spent six years doing that, um, did lots of different things, everything from, I was an Arabic interrogator for a short while, uh, cryptography, got into computer sciences a little bit, and became um, one of the information systems managers for the DOD, and uh, moved on from there, and uh, kind of the short, the abbreviated version of it, I worked at a strange little company called Enron Broadband Services for a while as was, was a field engineer. <laughs> um, after they did what they did, um, I was fairly upset at the industry, uh, started my own company, and for the next eight years I ran my own hosting company, um, primarily focused on hosting infrastructure as a service for online games. Um, I worked with 35 different game studios, 55 titles, um, and had servers all over the world. It was about 6,000 servers at its peak. Uh, Monty and I used to work together as well, um, separate companies, but did some business together. And um, since then, I decided to take the, the jump over from uh, being on the ops side, outside of a games company, to inside the games company. I uh, moved in, more into the development side of the business. I uh, worked for CCP Games, doing EVE Online, Dust 514, uh, for a couple of years out of Iceland. Um, and then uh, started a studio in Malta um, building a kids game, uh, which I did for just about two years as well. And um, now I'm at Jagex in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. I've um, been here a little less, a little over six months now, and I'm their executive director, primarily focused on managing the platform technology for building our current and new games. On. That's the short version. The short version. The short version. <laughs> So, Derek, um, you know, when you were, uh, there's so many things to ask you. Um, when you were at GNI, what were the big issues you were dealing with? Because you guys dealt with MMOs and things like that in operational support. And how does that look now? You know, what's changed in the industry in the last nine, ten years? Well, to be fair, when I, when I first started out, we, we started out like a lot of other hosting companies did for games. Uh, we were doing uh, clan server hosting. Someone wanted a Counter-Strike server for them and their four buddies for nine bucks a month, uh, and then we'd turn that up for them. Um, as, we, as, we, as we started digging into it, we realized that even the bigger studios were still doing very piecemeal hardware kind of infrastructure. There wasn't any consistency to what they were building. Basically, it was as cheap as they could get it, throw it into a rack, and hope it all worked out. Um, and this is just about the time that HP and a bunch of other companies were putting out um, their hot owl, cold owl, uh, high performance data center designs and, and explaining how to make a data center optimized and more performant. And um, we were kind of on the, on the early edge of that. I mean, we adopted um, blade servers and very dense compute environments in early 2003, 2004 uh, and built um, our environments from there. So I, I guess it wasn't that the industry or people were doing it wrong. It was that it, the industry was learning how to be more grown up. It was still very 
um, fledgling that still still acted like they were working in the garage building their first game um, when some of these companies had 500, 600, 2,000 you know, employees and needed to act more like a business. Um, and so I think that was the biggest problem we faced was companies companies growing up and getting used to doing kind of what enterprise businesses would do, um, but still trying to maintain that flexibility that, uh, that a video game company wants to be able to change direction or scale up and scale down. Interesting. It, now, l l let's talk a bit about Malta because Gary and I both lived vicariously through your Malta picks. For, <laughs> yeah, for sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I spent about... I lost a lot of friends on Facebook, um, uh, but I just moved from CCP Games in Iceland uh, to Malta, and um, all I did was post pictures of me drinking margaritas on the beach with my laptop out doing some development. Um, yeah, I have to say, and, it looks uh, like a terrible place. It just looked, it just looked yeah, it was, it was horrible. I never want to go there. You'd see a post yeah, from should, Derek saying, yeah, I, I just swam back from work today, and uh, <laughs> uh, going here for dinner. <laughs> it's just like, come on. It was pretty nice. It was hot enough to where I could actually jump into the sea from the office, swim back to my house, and be dry enough by the time I got to the cantina to have dinner. Uh, just make sure you put your money inside of a small Ziploc bag in your pocket. You're fine. Yeah. Um, but so, so, so what brought you there? You, you were head of studio. I mean, what, what, how did that deal come together? Uh, what were you trying to do? What's going on now? Oh, okay, so um, that's a, a video game company called TRC Family Entertainment. Um, see, their, their, their product is still under wraps and not public right now, so there's not a whole lot I can tell you in detail, except it's a, it's a children's product that's being built. Um, I, I met the investors. I was their first employee. They were trying to put the studio together. Uh, they needed a chief technical officer and a studio head, and uh, I volunteered for the job. Uh, we went to Malta and built the studio up to just shy of about 100 employees. Uh, working on a multi-platform product um, and just happened to be a, kind of a great culmination of, of uh, investment from the local government, uh, investors overseas, as well as a great piece of IP um, and some idea, um, all that had to be based in Malta for lots of financial reasons. Uh, so it really turned out really well as far as like building a community and a game studio from scratch and uh, working with the local um, colleges that were there that were, that were trying to, to push um, uh, new people our way. So we hired a great deal of junior employees. I can remember one afternoon we, we were going to hire, I think it was 12 or 13 junior QA game testers. And it ended up being like, a, like an episode of American Idol. Um, we had to <laughs> close down an auditorium at a, at a local college. 330 people showed up. Um, we were doing four minutes of CV to go through things, uh, cut after cut after cut, till we got down to our final 13. Um, and that's how you know ravenous the community was there about getting into games. So that's one of the reasons why we chose it, um, because of how um, how invested the community was in being there. That's a, that's amazing. You know, I remember um, talking to one of the investors around the time this deal was coming together, and I'd actually introduced them to the government in Nova Scotia that was trying to. Yeah. You know, man, it's, it was like you know, Derek's pictures would have been much different if they <laughs> ended up there. It would have been amazing. Yeah, I, I got the I got the pre the proofs of the um, location in St. John's Bay, and, and we didn't we didn't visit. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not. Uh, it's cold and rainy, and yeah, it's slightly different. Um, I just left Iceland. Why were you trying to do this? <laughs> I want to uh, we got, I want to I want to jump in we got a lot of questions about like you know how you know hiring and setting up studios and all kinds of stuff right now but I but I do have to jump in because today's kind of a big day at Jagex and we didn't really even kind of touch on that but R3 right I mean yeah RuneScape 3 sure. launches give me what, what's going on right now give me a little bit of what, what just happened with that aspect before we get back to like kind of the business side of it but it's kind of a pretty big day i gotta bring it up yeah it's um so rainscape 3 launched today actually it was kind of kind of weird that we were talking about doing this and it happens to be a launch day um rainscape 3 is the um kind of the next generation of the runescape um product it's been out for more than a decade now um it launched today, and it's the largest single update the game's ever had. Um, it's, it's all about a player-driven um, storyline now and a, and a bunch of other different things. Um, I'm not a designer on it, so I'm not going to go too much into detail about what mm -hmm. it does and doesn't do. 
Um, but there's a whole bunch of things technologically that are more advanced about it um, and um, looks better and it gives the player's ability to really interact more with the environment and make changes in what's going to happen in the universe. So it's um, taking that sandbox and kind of expanding to the next level and giving players um, a chance to do something more, even though it's uh, you know, coming from CCP as well, you, you know as long as you add content and expand the universe and let people um, experiment with their sandbox and build new toys, um, that it becomes a, an immersive environment that you want to keep, uh, participate in. Uh-oh, something went blue. Yeah, I, I, I think my screen just died on me, so stop playing. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, so um, yeah, RuneScape's um, phenomenal. It went really well today, too. Yeah, I, so I, it, it wasn't that long ago that nobody in their right mind related to a game would do anything on a patch day, especially not a, a, as major of a patch as this. It would be a week to a yep. week and a half of patching, recovering, oh, no, we missed this. That, that's an amazing shift. Yeah, I think it's I think it's kind of cool that um, Jagex is very confident in the technology and what, what they've been doing. Honestly, I think about how many years they've been working on it. They've they've really got this down to a science um, about how to run and operate the infrastructure and the systems. Um, I'm not on the ops side of this anymore. Um, I'm more on the production and uh, you know, game development side and technology development side. But um, it's nice to see these guys work. Um, there was definitely. Um, um, bubbly in the office around 4.30 today and uh, a really good time had by all. So one of the questions we get asked a ton on this show every single week is, is people looking to try and break into the industry and, um, you know, they all have different scenarios of some college, some not, different uh, careers, things like that. But mostly I think what they really want to get, they, 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 a lot of people like to know like what kind of skills um, people are looking for when they're hiring. So in your position, what kind of skills are you, do you look for when you're looking for a new hire? So for me specifically, um, I'm working on kind of a, a higher end technology section of the, of the company. So I'm really looking for people that have got experience working on developing product. Um, they need to be in the same language that I'm interested in. So right now my guys are primarily Java, Spring developers in Java framework specifically. Um, your knowledge of HTML5 would probably get you somewhere as well. Um, but it's, it's more than just um, having your uh, college degree and some basic experience at it. It's really about, I really like people who have done something on their own. We're in a world now where you can literally walk out and build your own app anytime you want to, build your own website, get something done. Um, and uh, doers really make a big difference in the, in the video game industry. Um, there's a lot of um, opportunity for someone who can actually deliver something uh, to make a make a head start and get ahead of someone else who has exactly the same CV. Um, so it's if you're an artist, you wouldn't walk in and tell someone about your art training. You'd walk in with your portfolio. Um, I encourage the developers to do the same thing: walk in with your portfolio of things that you've built and tools that you know how to work on, um, and some examples and demonstrations of it. Know the company that you're going to talk to, and uh, know what they're interested in. No, Derek, you um, you went from the Marines into technology, and we get questions from folks who are actively serving right mm -hmm. now, saying, "Hey, I'm an intelligence officer in Afghanistan, and uh, you know, I'm interested in games, but what the hell am I going to do?" Kind of thing. Talk a little bit about your story of going from the military into private industry. How did you make the decision? What did you go through? Uh, tell us that. Um, okay, so I'll take one step back and just make sure that you know I, I don't actually have like an engineering degree or background in, in uh, programming from college at least. Um, my experience really comes from just deciding I wanted to do it. Um, after I started working in communications, I think it was Windows NT 4.0, Microsoft MCSE, I think where I actually got started. Um, and I, I moved from there to really being interested in it. And again, um, I didn't ask for permission. I just started doing things, started building host environments and small server farms, um, tinkering around with any Cisco equipment that anyone would, le would let me borrow. Um, I had a friend that worked at Cisco, at Cisco in San Jose that um, happened to deal with the gray market products and would let me yeah. have them. Um, so, you know, using your contacts and getting things done um, uh, is, is one way to do it as well. Um, and the other one was, um, I hap because I was in the Marines for six years, I, I happen to get like a really nice lesson on uh, management, product management, um, um, and how to produce things. You don't think 
you you get that when you're when you're doing those jobs. But uh, for those that are actively serving, um, leadership skills are super hard to come by. Um, I can find really good programmers, um, and I, I deal with this all the time, where I can find someone who's a really great programmer, but as soon as we want to take that jump to saying, "Hey, can you take a couple of guys and run them for me? Help me uh, push other people to great success as well." It's a it's a different skill set, and it's something that um, we're always seeking. So. You'll almost always see a game company with a producer or senior producer uh, or associate producer role open because um, they're looking for those leaders and those drivers. So um, active duty military, um, that's a great way to go. Um, and there are some specific things you can do. Um, go read some Scrum Agile um, um, theory and get speed on how it works and why it's important and uh, adapt that. And um, look for places where you can get entry level positions. Um, QA is always a good place to start. Uh, community can be a good place to start as well. It, it um, you know, it kind of blows me away as to how connected people in the military are now. So, you know, geez, back when, um, oh, back when you were serving, uh, you have straight internet access. Were you watching web shows from the U.S.? Were you? No. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems amazing, you know that. That, that they've got that sort of connection there. No, I, I, think, I think I remember being in Okinawa, Japan on something called Blue Mail. It was a blue screen with white text on it, and that was the entire, entire communication system. So, uh, so no, this is, um, it, I think it's very different today, um, and the, the opportunity is greater, especially for the, we, we were talking about this, I think, at GDC in San Fran, uh, about activity service members and games, and I think there's a big opportunity there. Um, it just, um, have to find the right spot. If you're technologically savvy, if you're doing any programming, um, I was lucky enough. I was also um, a cryptographer in the Marines for, for a short while, so it made it possible for me to do a little bit on the coding side, a little bit on the hardware side, um, and then I went fairly hardcore on the hardware side after that. But um, I got to dabble on both sides and um, made it easy for me to be kind of a jack of all trades. And um, it's not a bad thing to do. Uh, at, at my company, at Jagex, right now. Um, I can list a handful of people that are just can do anything. Um, I, we can call them for, for management purposes. We can call them for uh, specific technical needs. Um, they're good leaders. You know, th those kind of people are, are just invaluable for organizations, uh, not just games, but any company, really. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, um, I actually spent uh, a good bit of time the last few days working with one of the students we have in our summer program going through, yes, you can ask a question and get an answer. But you're better off figuring it out for yourself. You can learn a lot more. You become a bit of a generalist, and you're more useful. And, and that just it, that matters a lot for people. Is uh, start somewhere, but learn everything. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the most frustrating thing is to be um, in an interview with someone that's got fantastic potential, and they've never gone past what they've been told to do. So um, just go the next step. Do something. Um, the worst case scenario, you'll make a, a multi-million dollar app on iTunes and make a lot of money before you get the job, um, or um, we'll, we'll think it's awesome and we'll want to hire you. You mentioned um, you mentioned earlier about setting you you set up your own studio. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what's it like setting up your own studio? Um, it's probably the craziest thing I've ever done in my whole life. Um, <laughs> I, I ran my own company, and it wasn't as crazy as trying to build a studio from scratch. Uh, um, I guess the base way I can explain it was just managed chaos. Um, trying to figure out how to get the creative done and get the, get the design that we needed without any people, without enough people there, all while trying to get a head start on the software development and, and hiring the right people for that. So it's, um, it's a strange balance um, when you've got um, an investor and the money and the general idea and you need to turn it into an actual product um, really, really rapidly too. So there's usually timelines associated with these things. Um, I think in nine months we went from me as the first employee to 90 employees. And that's um, really, really hard to manage. Um, it's risky as well because you usually get a few of the wrong people that won't fit for long term in, in, in the very, very beginning. Uh, have to deal with a little bit of churn and getting the, getting the right team in place. Um, but it's, um, it's fun. You know, you get to put people in their dream jobs. Um, I still have people that I can uh, stay in touch with from my, from my last uh, company in Malta who are just um, absolutely excited about what they do and about how they got into the industry. Um, so startups are just another great place to get into the industry as well um, and, and get your foot in the door where you might not be able to walk into EA the first day that you want to apply for a job. 
let's go. Hey, let me take you back to your your ops time at CCP. There was a patch where you and I got into. Um, it, it was kind of funny when Derek was at G and I. We were customers of his. He had to be nice to us. When he went to CCP, <laughs> they were customers of ours. We had to be nice to him. It was. <laughs> this is why I made the switch. I got tired of selling stuff and I wanted to buy things. So that's why. Uh, it's you know I, I always say to people it's great to be on the buy side. I love when I switch back to the buy side. But there was a patch where we ran into a problem, and you know it was actually kind of neat how the problem came about and how it got resolved. You want to talk about that a little bit? You remember the details? Uh, so um, are, are you talking about the uh, the DOS day? Yes, the DOS day. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've kind of blocked part of it out, so I don't have all the specifics. You probably remember more than me, but um, we we had a um, a synchronous link with Vivox doing the voice chat for for you online, and I, I believe we were doing some testing on trying to get some extra channels up and running and testing uh, some of our new fleet chat systems. And uh, along the way, our test server was set on automated, and we were expanding the chat rooms and the connections to see how far we could take it, um, all without forgetting. We're all, for, all while forgetting that we're connected live to Vivox, and I, I believe we DOSed Vivox at one time. Um, when I say we, it's another guy that did it. I didn't have anything to do with it, of course. I'd never do that to Monty, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's funny to see uh, when you're on the bleeding edge of trying to do things and push technology to the edge, you, you do break things quite a lot. And um, I remember breaking uh, Monty once or twice. It, it was one of those things where. Uh, it was supposed to be one machine that was making these calls, and it got pushed to the entire cluster. Yeah. So Eve's whole blade array was firing <laughs> requests off at us. But you know, figuring it out was really kind of neat because, you know, on the ops side, there were folks, uh, you know, on Derek's team who were not very happy with us. They thought, you know, we we're a bunch of losers who messed up, and how come we didn't know X, Y, Z about databases? And we were looking at this and saying. Gee, we don't. Our database isn't where our problem is. Is you're sending us way more traffic than you ever did before, and we're, we're concerned about traffic. And luckily, because Derek and I knew each other, we could sort of, okay, look, it's not that either one of us are idiots. Let's find out what the problem is, and that came out yeah. kind of nicely. Yeah, it's. I think that's um, one of the things about the nice small community still at, in online games um, is that you can still call someone on the other side. Um, I, I can't get over how many. How many people I know that have worked at five different vendors or or six or seven different video game companies you can have that connection. So building that network really helps, um, especially when you need to figure something out quickly. You usually know someone in ops and, and someone on the development side. So, you know, Monty and I could just get on the phone and uh, without yelling at one, each, one another, just trying to figure out what the problem was while uh, everyone else spun around in circles. Uh, there was a Did great time where, sorry, Gary, that somebody was really ticked in. And Derek came in really calmly and said, "Look, I know these guys. They actually can do what they say they're doing. <laughs> That's not the problem. Let's move on." So it was great. Yeah. Derek, before we wrap up, if you could, if you could give, what would be your your best like you, advice to people out there? Um, we get a lot of people who are in in current like career positions and things like that, and they kind of want to change careers, but they're always afraid to kind of like jump out and you know, make a huge shift like that. Um, and a lot of people like don't necessarily always have the experience. And like you said, you didn't get a college degree in some of the aspects that you're uh, very successful. in. so I don't know what, what kind of like leaving advice could you give for people out there who would want to break into the video game industry, but don't just don't know, really know where to start. Um, I, I guess the easiest thing to say is you really have to just be ready to, to take the risk and do it. Um, I don't know anything that I've done in my life so far that wasn't risky or scary. Um, that was also worth it. So um, you're just you're just going to be happier uh, with find out what makes you happy, uh, or what you think might make you happy, and just do it. Um, if you want to get into the online games industry, um, there is someone on your LinkedIn, your Facebook, your Twitter um, that knows someone there. Contact them and ask for some advice. Um, you wouldn't believe how friendly and open a great deal this community is, uh, and would would ha be happy to have uh, more talented people on board. You don't have to be um, the programmer that's worked on 50 games just to get into a game company. Everyone started somewhere. And as soon as you realize that everyone started at an entry-level position, I was installing cables uh, under floor tiles and data centers uh, when I got started in this. 
So it's, um, it's find an entry-level position that meets your career needs and go ahead and, and do it. If you want to be the executive producer of a video game studio and you've never worked on anything, maybe you need to start somewhere else first. Um, so take a humble approach to it. Get in, kick ass, take names, and have fun. I can say that. There you go. Right. Derek Wise, thanks so much for coming on the show and answering uh, all those questions. And great to see from you. And uh, hopefully I'll keep watching you on Facebook and seeing on all your crazy vacation adventures. Okay, great. <laughs> thanks, Derek. Uh, Monty Sharma, Thanks, follow sir. him on Twitter at uh, Monster, M-O-N-T-S-T-E-R 27. And if you guys have questions for Monty, uh, send them over to Monty at GameBreaker.tv. That's where you can send them. Always a pleasure. And you can follow me at Gary Gannon. Follow GameBreaker TV at GameBreaker TV. And we do the show live every single Tuesday. Except today isn't Tuesday, Except but today, we do it every Tuesday. Every we do it every Tuesday at 3, but made an exception this week. Let's come on over and watch the live show. Uh, we have uh, another show. Well, I don't know. We don't have another interview. I think they'll end up next week, so I think we're back to Q&A. So make sure to send those questions in, and don't forget your video questions. If you guys have video questions, send it over to Monty. Record yourself on YouTube and post it up. Send us the link. We'll play it on the show. Thanks for watching. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.